Well, we've talked uh, quite a bit now about identifying a molecular target in a cancer and then using a targeted drug in that population. We have another targeted agent, bevacizumab, targeted against angiogenesis, where we don't yet at least have a consensus that we can measure the target in a way that could direct us to use the drug. Uh, so, uh, Mark, and then Corey, I'll ask you to comment on this as well. Uh, in 2013, when do you incorporate bevacizumab together with chemotherapy or other agents in a newly diagnosed patient with stage four non-small cell lung cancer? I should say also of the non-squamous type. Right. So as long uh, you know, as uh, our workup, we would uh, identify those patients with genotypic abnormalities, and they would go to other trials. And so this is the non-squamous, uh, non-small. So my my criteria for using bevacizumab are obviously uh, the histology issue, as we've highlighted, um, uh, presence of hemoptysis. Uh, in, we can argue about how much hemoptysis is too much hemoptysis, but I think all of us have our, have our um, uh, uh, level of comfort with, with the history of uh, hemoptysis. Um, uh, no untreated brain mets. I think we have evidence that treated brain mets, assuming the patient is uh, stable um, uh, after treatment, uh, this drug can be safely administered. I tend to restrict my use to the population in which it was studied, which is ECOG PS0 to 1 patients, and then um, certain comorbidities, a recent stroke, recent uh, MI, um, a, uh, arterial thrombosis, uh, um, would make me shy away from using it. Uh, so those are my criteria, and you know, it's, it's the minority of patients in my practice that end up getting bevacizumab. You know, I, I happen to think that uh, bevacizumab is a drug with clear utility. Uh, Dr. Sandler's study showed a survival advantage, and we have um, some other trials that on face value and on paper are technically positive trials, although we struggle with the survival results of the AVAIL trial uh, in, in, in the chemo that was used in that particular trial compared to standard carboplatinum and uh, taxol. So, so those, those are kind of my criteria. I, I, I do think the other issue is that bevacizumab is a first-line decision. So if you opt out of not using this drug, which I think has utility, um, you can't use it in the second, third line. We, we don't have data. Um, at least you're at risk of not being able to use it, re really for reimbursement uh, issues, um, which, which are, with an expensive drug, can be significant to a practitioner. Um, so, so I think it's a decision you make in the first line. Uh, I tend to use it um, uh, as continuation maintenance until progression, but abandon it at the time of progression uh, to move on to other things. Well, maybe let me ask actually Alan first then, <clears throat> since he's the architect of the ECOG uh, 4599 trial, and uh, especially Alan, how do you use bevacizumab in your practice? And particularly, can you address Mark's question about post-progression continuation of bevacizumab? An easy question. Right, <laughs> right. So, um, so I can always address that. Can I answer it? Probably not. But um, so I, I follow very similar to what uh, Mark was saying. I mean, I, I look for to use bevacizumab initially. So I, when I'm screening patients in the frontline setting, I look to see if they're BEV eligible. Um, <clears throat> and um, you know, tend to use the, the original regimen of paclitaxel carboplatin with bevacizumab. And then uh, treat for four cycles, although the study was uh, uh, up to six cycles of therapy. Um, and then the bevacizumab as maintenance. Um, and then I stop the bevacizumab um, at time of progression or, or toxicity. Uh, there are some thoughts uh, and potentially emerging data to suggest that maybe we should continue that um, uh, beyond progression. But um, at this point, I have not been doing that. And I think Corey, Corey, I'd certainly like to comment on that. There are recent data in colorectal cancer that have shown that bevacizumab beyond progression when paired with second line treatment is superior to second line treatment alone, and it's actually generated survival advantage. We do not have data of that sort mm -hmm. with non-small cell lung cancer, but we do have a clinical trial that's ongoing. The AVA-ALT trial is actually asking that question in patients who have made it to maintenance treatment. So presumably have had a benefit on bevacizumab, who are either stable or responding after at least two cycles, who subsequently progress 
are then randomized to a standard second line agent, which would of course include either pemetrexid, docetax, or lotinib, plus or minus continuation of bevacizumab. I think the other very important issue is the nature of maintenance treatment. There's an ongoing ECOG trial, for instance, which is comparing the standard bevacizumab, although if we're frank, it's never been compared versus observation in the maintenance setting. So we do not have real phase three survival data for maintenance bevacizumab, but because of the 4599 trial, it's become the standard. It is comparing that regimen to switch maintenance with pemetrexid versus a hybrid of continuation and switch maintenance uh, with the combination. I think that's a crucially important uh, trial based on some of the other trials that have uh, emerged over the last year or two, the Avipril trial in Europe and uh, the recent Point Break trial. But, but unfortunately, no, no yeah. maintenance arm. I don't know if you're going to mention that. In, no. in the ECOG either, you still don't have the right. no maintenance. Well, I mean, what I was going to say is uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, using paradigms established in other solid tumors to dictate what oh, we do with lung cancer, but uh, re with regard to the maintenance question, you, you called in the colorectal data, I'll call in the ovarian data, which suggests that uh, it does have a maintenance effect um, in that setting. So uh, I, I think we don't know. I, I, I would like, and I had... Uh, harped for many years after your trial and actually tried to mount an investigator initiated trial to explore you know the, the a true maintenance trial mm -hmm. with BEV and it was never um, accomplished. Well another study that was attempted I'm sure David and, and Corey and Anna will remember as well was uh, many years ago in the cooperative groups we talked about doing a continuous bevacizumab beyond progression study as well and there were issues just because of the half-life should we do it not right. do it couldn't get uh, the but now that trial support. is ongoing yeah right yeah. which I think is interesting I, and I think the one of the bigger questions David is is when you decide to use bev and, and I agree with Alan I can, tend to think of who are the patients I'm going to use it in because I do think it has utility what are you going to use it with which which chemotherapy doublet are going to use? That's a use great it? question, yeah. but I'm not sure we have enough time to answer that <laughs> one. Well, what do you think, Mark? Is well, there a preference for a chemotherapy marriage with uh, bevacizumab? Um, I, I, you know, you can't refute the data with carboplatinum and paclitaxel, the ECOG 4599 data. I think there was general enthusiasm for carbopemetrexid bevacizumab because of the use of pemetrexid in a non-squamous population. However, you know, that enthusiasm has been a bit quelled based upon the point break data where the primary endpoint of overall survival was not different uh, be, be between that. And I think most people were expecting the PEM arm to be less toxic, and it wasn't, in my opinion. It was just differently toxic uh, to patients. And so I think the point break kind of creates two possibilities, and there may be individual patient reasons why you may favor PEM, but my sentiment has been to use more of the 4599 regimen because, again, thinking about, you know, you, you have the likelihood of giving multiple lines of therapy. Uh, PEM is an option for maintenance and second line treatment, whereas that's not an option for bevacizumab-based uh, th therapy. So that's kind of how, how my thinking's changed. The Can I break. just ask the panel then? Uh, I want to ask each panel member, and I, it'll just be a yes or no question. And so the question is, is there a special ma magic in non-small cell lung cancer between bevacizumab and taxanes? Yes or no? Corey? Maybe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly in breast cancer, there's been some suggestion of it. I, I am not necessarily convinced there is. So I, I'm, I don't know versus no. Only Dr. Langer can answer a yes or no question this way. <laughs> Anne? So yes, I do think there is one. Alan? The clinical data would say yes at this point. Yes. Mark? And I'm a yes man too. <laughs>